Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> and thank you, Stefan, for asking me to, uh, to put the sun in a light bulb, in essence. Um, so uh, he, we, we're going to focus on uh, three topics, uh, blood pressure control, glucose management, and caniectomy. Uh, and first, before we go to that, let's talk about who's going to be in the neuro ICU compared to, let's say, the floor. So these are the guidelines. And as you can see here, uh, first, the neurocritical care units are an essential, uh, important part, integral part of uh, comprehensive stroke centers. And you're going to put patients who have large hemispheric strokes, or patients who are intubated, or patients who have an unstable hemodynamic profile, or patients who are, uh, you know, on the watch for caniectomy, you know, because they can deteriorate. So these are the patients. And the same thing for the recommendations by uh, Dr. Wisdick's paper, uh, also uh, about cerebral edema. So large territorial stroke, uh, need more close monitoring, and these are the patients that will end up in the, in the neuro ICU. Um, does it improve the outcome, having a neurointensive and neuro ICU? Well, that's a little bit more controversial, and as you can see, the data does not show any decrease in mortality except for one study, but clearly, it, they decrease the length of stay in the ICU, make the administrators happy, and maybe some of them actually may end up uh, going home uh, uh, you know, when they are in the neuro ICU compared to any other unit. So there are some data about that. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about blood pressure control after a neuro ICU admission. You would expect, obviously, that uh, you know, being in a very highly monitored unit, you, you will be able to control the blood pressure very well. Not exactly that. The data do not show that. So this is a nice study that shows in, in the middle, actually, that the uh, blood pressure in these patients with, uh, with strokes, on the average, were outside the recommended range almost one third of the time. So even under the best circumstances, we may not be able to control the blood pressure beautifully, exactly 99% or 100%. And what's the right blood pressure? Well, again, the recommendations, uh, before we go to that, uh, we, we know now that uh, you know, very high blood pressure, very low blood pressure actually may uh, lead to worse outcomes. Uh, and there is a sweet spot in the middle. Uh, so there is a U type of curve there, as you can see on the left and on the right, about mortality in these patients. And we need to find this sweet spot. So it's very difficult. And we go to guidelines, because that's the best thing to, uh, to, to have, the most condensated uh, um, uh, information in these patients. And if you don't give TPA in these patients, they are outside the window, then the guidelines support the blood pressure. Don't treat the blood pressure unless the blood pressure goes above um, to, um, 220 systolic and 120 diastolic. Uh, if you want to try to treat it, then don't go below 15% from, from the baseline. Again, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Um, you know, because if you have somebody who has, let's say, lives with a blood pressure of 220 every day, uh, that's okay to have the blood pressure as high as that. But if you have somebody who lives with a blood pressure of 100, a young patient probably shouldn't allow this patient to go so high up. Also, you need to think about the rest of the body because you know, if, if you have, let's say, a big MI or a CHF patient, are you going to allow this patient with an ejection fraction of, I don't know, 15% to go all the way up to 220? Absolutely not. So again, nobody knows what would be the sweet, uh, sweet uh, spot in these patients. But in essence, if you don't know, just lower the blood pressure by 15%. So again, what about if you have uh, patients uh, who get TPA, uh, IV thrombolysis? So this goes back to the uh, initial NIH uh, study. And you can see that even before that, pilot studies showed that the diastolic blood pressure actually was associated with hemorrhagic conversion in these patients. And even in the NIH study, one out of five patients uh, did not have blood pressure below the goal, as I'm going to show you. Uh, at that time, and two-thirds of them actually, even after giving TPA, were not within the range that we wanted to be. So what are the current guidelines? The current guidelines support to, to have a blood pressure below 185 over 110 diastolic before you give TPA. And you can use labetalol, you can use nicardipine, you can use hydrolyzing, you can use an alapril that doesn't work so fast. After you give TPA, the blood pressure should be five points lower. You know, it would be 180 over 105. If the blood pressure, despite all these measures, is very high, so it's above, let's say, diastolic above 140 on the very bottom, then you can use nipride. I haven't used that nipride for the last 10 years. I don't know if Stefan has used it. We, we don't use it in the ICU. But we have new drugs right now. So what about home antihypertensives? What are we going to do for these patients who, obviously, many of them are, uh, are on antihypertensive treatment? Either you discontinue them or you reduce the dose. So don't discontinue beta blockers. Try to half the dose if you want. 
Uh, and then when are you going to give them back to them? Um, again, you know, nobody knows, but probably the best would be to, uh, to initiate the, the antihypertensive treatment 24 hours after the, uh, uh, the stroke. So this just came out. It's from uh, Memphis. Uh, um, and in essence, uh, this talks about patients with large vessel occlusion the first, during the first 24 hours. And they look at the blood pressure. And what they show here, actually, is that um, for having independence, independent living after three months, uh, the blood pressure in these patients was higher than the, the patients who had lower blood pressure. Uh, and the same thing for mortality. The blood pressure of those patients who died actually was higher than the patients who survived. And if you look at the bottom uh, on the right, then you can see that there is an inverse relationship between uh, um, uh, three-month uh, independent living with uh, uh, ranking uh, 0 to 2, and then the mortality also. So the higher the blood pressure, the, the more the mortality, and the, uh, the, the higher the blood pressure, the less the independent living. Dr. Mai actually write, wrote a very nice uh, uh, editorial about that. So which one is the sweet spot in these patients? So comparing to blood pressure of 220 and comparing to blood pressure of 140, it looks like uh, blood pressure below 160 over 90 is the sweet spot. So that improved a little bit the mortality, a little bit the mortality in these patients. But again, when are we going to uh, uh, you know, start again treating these patients? Uh, uh, you know, how long after? So this is an older study. It's interesting because uh, uh, there is uh, a correlation between the blood pressure and the TCD velocities if you do the TCD transcranial Doppler ve velocities uh, monitoring in these patients. So normally, when the blood pressure goes up, the TCD velocity does not necessarily go up immediately at the same spot. It goes down. So there is a phase reverse, a phase difference between the two, uh, the two curves, as you can see on the bottom. So normally, this phase difference is around 65 degrees. And if it is less than 30, then you don't have autoregulation in these patients. So they did a study. And they look at patients at one day, four days, and almost 10 days later. And as you can see on the left, uh, on day one and day four, there was no autoregulation because the angle was very low. And then anywhere between 4.1 days and 9.75 days, actually, this changed. So if you want to, uh, to say, well, we're going to start treating these patients, probably you should treat them after the first four days maybe up to 10 days. What about glucose? Changing gears here. Yeah, there are many reasons, actually, to try to control the glucose in these patients. And uh, you, you see it on the top. And actually, there are data that show that uh, the, the outcomes, if you have uh, admission hyperglycemia in these patients, uh, is, is worse. So you have uh, worse functional outcomes. You have increased risk for symptomatic ICH. And you have decreased recanalization. So it looks like uh, you know, this is an easy target for, for us. But you know, the, the argument there is, is it an epiphenomenon or it is a real problem? So all the older studies, as you can see on the right, show that actually the outcomes were worse if the, if the admission glucose was high. So for every 100 grams uh, uh, per deciliter, actually increased glucose in these patients, the outcome was worse. Uh, the favorable outcome at three months, for instance, on the right side was worse. So again, you know, there are good data about that. So what are the guidelines uh, tell you? Uh, well, they ask you to keep the, blood, the, the, the glucose between 140 and 180, uh, both of them. And actually, even uh, the AHA guidelines for ischemic stroke, <clears throat> the same thing, 140 over 180. Um, just out of the oven, just recently, actually, there was a paper in stroke that uh, looked at uh, patients who had uh, uh, thrombectomy, so large vessel occlusion with thrombectomy. And they tried to see if the glucose played any role in these, uh, in these uh, patients. And as you can see, there was either the admission glucose or the hyperglycemia in these patients did not show any difference in the outcome uh, after thrombectomy. Um, and again, these are the, 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 the plots. And again, obviously, the, the thrombectomy shows much better outcome in these patients, but the effect of hyperglycemia or nomoglycemia did not change that. And the same thing, there was no difference in recolonization rates in this uh, uh, very recent study from Mr. Clean, actually, so one of the five studies. So their, their conclusion was that uh, they didn't find any evidence of effect modif modification of intraarterial treatment by admission serum glucose in patients with acute ischemic stroke. Nice statement. So what are we going to do? Is it over? No, it's not, because we have a study. And Henry Ford is one of the sites of the study. And actually, uh, it's called the SHINE. And uh, I think uh, Chris is the, the PI, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So we don't know yet. 
And I'll finish a little bit uh, talking about uh, the compressive craniectomy. This is bilateral, as you can see, and the, the timing, because that, that's a major question. When are you going to do the, the craniectomy? Are you going to do it immediately? Are you going to do it uh, after five uh, days? When? So are you going to do it when you have this oval pupil? This is an oval pupil in one of our patients, actually. So this is the first step for, for herniation. So this is, if you pick it up, if the nurses pick it up at that stage, that's the first step. And then the next step would be to have a blown pupil in these patients. So are you going to do it when the patient has an oval pupil? Are you going to do it when the patient has a blown pupil? When? So if you look at older studies, and actually the, uh, the, the first studies from Germany, this is Stefan Schwab's study from 1998, he divided the patients into craniectomy uh, less than 24 hours and patients with craniectomy after 24 hours. And you cannot see it very well, but just to magnify it, you can see that the ones that had uh, uh, craniectomy in less than 24 hours, then the, more, the, uh, the signs of herniation before surgery was only 13% versus the other ones that late ones, 75%. So if you wait, then you will have many more chances for having herniation. And then the mortality rate was half in the early group than in the late group. And the late group was half of the ones that did not get any the compressive craniectomy. So these are pretty good data, actually, uh, convincing data that you need to do it early on. And these are the guidelines. Uh, and I put all three uh, papers. Um, the one that there is no question about that is obviously uh, if you have a posterior fossa uh, big stroke compressing the, uh, the fourth ventricle or compressing the brain stem in these patients, then you need to decompress uh, uh, the posterior fossa. Now, supratentorially, when are you going to do it? Again, what they, they are saying here, the guidelines that we had with Michel uh, Torbe, uh, again, try to do it if you do it during the first 24, 48 hours. If you want to wait, how are you going to um, look at these patients? You know, look at the clinical exam. If the patient's uh, clinical exam deteriorates and there is no other reason for that, that would be a, a strong uh, um, reason to, to do the craniectomy uh, before you blow a pupil. Um, what about ICP? I didn't put any slide here. Um, you know, there are convincing data that the ICP goes up after you, you, you herniate. So don't wait and don't base your judgment based on the, on the ICP. Um, when, when you herniate, you compress the midbrain, you compress the aqueduct, you develop hydrocephalus and the ICP goes up. It's too late. You need to do it before that happens. All right, that's all, folks. Uh, thank you very much.